Two weeks ago, we looked at the walk and talk towards outsiders. Then last week, we looked at, once again, outsiders, but more so, how we could make the outsiders insiders. It wasn't just exactly and only about evangelism, but ultimately that's what it had in mind, ways we can be more evangelistic. Well, tonight I want us to look at this one verse, but it has much to do not now with outsiders, but the insiders, those in the church, our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not now the walk and talk towards outsiders, but kind of, if you would, the walk and talk towards the insiders. Verse 14, And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. As you would consider this, I hope that you would not think, yes, I have been waiting for someone to encourage me and help me and be patient towards me. Oh, by the way, those are the things most people would like. Not so much the first. See, we don't want the warning because the warning here is kind of got the edge of rebuke but this is not an entitlement to be expected from others but rather it's a duty and responsibility that we have toward others hope you kind of make that clear As I read these things, it's not an entitlement I expect from others, but it's rather a duty and responsibility I have towards others. JFK, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, in his inaugural address, he made this statement and probably one of the most famous statements from an inaugural address. He said, ask not what your country can do for you, Ask what you can do for your country. And I almost, when I look at chapter 5, verse 14, it's not I ask what somebody can do for me, but it's rather ask what I can do for the others. Sometimes people talk, well, there's two kinds of people in this world. There's the givers and the takers. Well, I think there should be three people because you see, I don't think it should be that, well, we get frustrated if it's just the takers. All they want is to take, to take, to take, never to give. We're more impressed with the givers. They give, they give, they give. But the reality is, it's not givers or takers that we need to be. We need to be, I'm going to call it participants. There's times that we that we're the givers. And then there's the times where we have the needs and others give to us. And it's all right to take. That's the way this life is. Be a participant, a giver and a taker. Just right here, it's about the giving what we can do for someone else. Now let's look at some of the things that's mentioned here. First it begins, we urge you brothers. So it's not just the statement, but it's an urging. It's like a a pleading. You do this. He mentions four things. The first is admonish the idol. Now, another translation says warning. I personally tend to like the word warning better. They mean the same thing, but 
Well, we don't use the word admonish as much as we do the word warning. And a warning is a statement or event that indicates a possible or impending danger, problem, or other unpleasant situation. It's cautionary advice. There was a program on TV back. It starts actually in the late 50s. Um, I was too young to remember those early days, but I remember faintly the program being on in the 60s. And you could go to YouTube today and actually look at an episode or two. It's Truth or Consequences. Now, that particular show, I'm not sure how much it was big on the consequences. I don't remember a lot about it. But this warning, I think the warning is truth or consequences. It's kind of like the warning. You're setting before someone a certain truth. And they follow and live that truth. And a failure to do so is to reap the consequences. Warn? Warn? Yes. It's not an easy thing to do. And I would suggest to you that if we're going to, if we're going to warn, that we have to be very wise, discerning, even a little bit brave and bold. You can almost be sure of this. Most people don't like the warning. Because like I said, there's an edge of rebuke with this idea of warning. But nevertheless, he says, we've got to be warning. Warn the idol. Now, this word is an interesting word. It's in Greek, a tactos. It's translated in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 in the King James Version with disorderly. And it actually was a military term indicating out of rank. Now someone might say, well, why is it translated here idle? And I can frankly appreciate this word idle because I think it is truly translated properly within its context. And you can find the idol, well, he says, warn the idol. Turn over two pages, 2 Thessalonians 3. 2 Thessalonians 3. Look down at verse 6. He says, now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away, withdraw, from every brother who is walking as I mentioned, King James Version has the word disorderly. Here we have walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you have received from us. For you yourselves know how that you ought to imitate us because we were not idle, we were not disorderly when we were with you. So if we want an idea of what's this, what's this disorderly, what is this idle? How do we get that, that word? Well, he's going to describe how he was not disorderly, not idle. He says, verse 8, Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. So his emphasis here is we worked. That's how we were not disorderly. That's how we were not, yes, Somebody working, they're not idle. Now verse 9, it was not because we do not have that right, but to give you and ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that there are some among you who walk in, walk disorderly, walk in idleness, and this is defined not busy at work, but busybodies. So when Paul wrote back in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 14, admonish the idol, I think he had specific problem in mind there at Thessalonica. Some people who were just choosing not to work. 
But mind you, he gets to a point in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, where he says, you keep away from or withdraw yourselves from this brother who is idle. Now, how did he get to that point? We find within this context of him saying, why, when we were there with you, that, uh, you know, we taught you to work. And oh, by the way, while we were there with you, we worked so you might have something to imitate. And then if you want to kind of get a further progress on this particular thing, back in chapter 4, verse 12, he said, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. And that's out of verse 11 where he says that you are to work with your hands as we instructed you. So he has said, when we were there, we taught you to work. When we were there, we were examples of work. Now he's writing to them in 1 Thessalonians 4, 11 and 12 to work. And then in chapter 5, because there's an apparent problem, he says, now you warn these people. So here's a responsibility we have. To warn thee, okay, idle. But I think we'd recognize that when there is a sin problem, and it's obvious, and it's evident, you teach. You be an example. But it may become necessary to get to a point where you've got to directly warn that individual of his sin. Guess what? When you read that right there, it's not written to a select group of the congregation. It's not just you elders. It's not just you deacons. It's the congregation. We all have this responsibility. As you would see the idea of warn. In Colossians 1.28, Paul said, Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect or mature in Christ Jesus. And in Acts 20, verse 31, you read, Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish or warn everyone with tears. So Paul, he himself... He had warned while in the presence. He had warned by virtue of epistle. And now he says, you brethren, you warn the idol. Now notice the next thing that he says. He says, encourage the faint-hearted. Encourage the faint-hearted. Now the King James Version has the term feeble-minded. And, and I'll admit, when I think of feeble-minded, well, in today's vernacular, it doesn't kind of carry the best meaning, at least with what I think about feeble-minded. But the word actually is from a, if you could, a, a compound word. And the first part of the word was little, and the second part of the word was spirited. Little-spirited. I think the idea of faint-hearted is better. Care is the idea of little-spirited. And it is more true to what Paul meant. The faint-hearted. Those that are getting weary. Those who are becoming discouraged. Now, why are they weary or discouraged? The text doesn't say. Just, they are. Now, I'll admit this, if you're going to know if someone's faint-hearted, you've got to know that person. Just seeing their face on Sunday doesn't get you there. Only knowing their name, you're not going to know. It's going to take knowing that person. Recently, I listened to a, a lesson in the, the speaker who was not speaking at his home congregation but began to speak of the people in his congregation, not by name, but he just kind of started on each pew, and he says, on this pew is a brother. 
And he told that brother's problem. And he said on the pew back behind him as a sister. And then began to tell her problem. Now this was not in any way to reveal confidences. And no one could determine who these individuals were. His point was that everybody kind of was dealing with something almost. But the only way to know that was to know those people. I suggested you, we need to know each other better. To know if this person is faint-hearted, discouraged, weary. And then it's, we are to be the ones to encourage the faint-hearted. You know, he had just almost made mention of this. Chapter 5, verse 11. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Uh, they're already doing it. But he says, verse 11, you encourage one another. And then down here in verse 14, encourage the faint-hearted. It's like you're already doing it, but you need to do it more. There's a lot of things that are that way, aren't they? Even if you're doing it, you need to do it more. You need to do it better. Encourage faint-hearted. And so how can you encourage? How? How can you encourage? I think that generally the cards that we send out, they're great encouragements individuals. Now, I'll admit this. I don't think those cards are going to do the best for warning the idle or warning those who have need of warning. You really need to do that face to face. And you're going to need to know that person instead of make a lot of assumptions about what they're doing. You, you need to, to know that person. But these cards, that's great for encouraging Phone calls, great for encouraging. A personal visit and time spent with, great for encouraging. And sometimes just that brief word is what's needed. Or maybe it's just you're there. They're so despondent. They don't want to speak, have nothing to say. But you're there. Encourage the faint-hearted. And then next he says, help the weak. Help the weak. Now this word help is, it's translated help in ESV, but it's uphold in the New King James Version. It's support in the King James Version. Now, actually, all three of those words are good translations. Now, I'll admit, if someone said, which do you like better? I like the idea of uphold or support better than just help. Those words mean help, but it gives me almost a picture of, you're, you know, you're holding this person up. It's almost like you're keeping them going. Help the weak. It's almost like they can't do it anymore by themselves. They've got to have you or somebody. Whether it's physically, whether it's spiritually, whether it's emotionally, they, they've reached a breaking point. I, I, I find it interesting. Warn the idol... Encourage the faint-hearted. But you support or uphold the weak. Now, if we were to say, hmm, who are the weak? Uh, well, Romans speaks of the weak. Listen, Romans 15, verses 1 and 2. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. 
Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build them up. And then, of course, in Romans 14, 14 through 23, there's a discussion of the weak brother and how we are to determine not to destroy our brother through the use of our liberties. So in Romans, you've got something said about the weak brother. Here, Paul just says three words. Support the weak. Okay, once again, it's going to take knowing your brother if you're going to know he's weak. But I think it's also going to take effort, time, energy, maybe money, sacrifice, because you're holding him up and you're supporting him. Now, I would hope that it would be that he's not always that way. That it's kind of, you're the bridge getting him to the other side. If you live long enough, you're going to need somebody to be your bridge. This verse, once again, though, it's not about an entitlement of what we have and should expect from others. It's rather instructions about how and what we are to do for others. But I've found it this way, and I've observed it. That person who had, at every turn, been willing to encourage the faint-hearted, was supporting and upholding the weak, that when he or she got to that point where they were the weak one, people were there. They had been there for others. And then people were there for them. Help. Help the weak. Then last, he says, be patient with them all. This may have been the most important phrase of this whole verse. Because I think it somewhat applies to all whether they are the idle, whether they are the faint-hearted, and whether they are the weak, be patient with them all. Let's see. The idle. Patient with the idle. Wait. You just read in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, that Paul said to withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly or is idle. It sounds like Paul said, you can get to a point where you withdraw fellowship. Yes. Can I say yes, but? Once again, it was after. Paul had been there teaching them to work. Paul had been there providing an example of work so that they would have something to imitate. It was after Paul had written in 1 Thessalonians again with instruction to work. And it was after Paul had said, okay, brothers, you warned those folks who are idle. And it was only after all of that that he said, you withdraw yourselves. I think I see within this patience where the concern is with that brother, not we want to cut him off. Patience. Patience toward the faint-hearted. You encourage. And you encourage again. And you even encourage some more. And maybe you're thinking, well, I'm not seeing the results. He didn't say get results, he said to encourage. The faint-hearted. Do you know there's a tendency for the faint-hearted to be faint-hearted? Somebody might say, well, that could go without saying. And what I mean is, some people have very strong dispositions. Emotionally, spiritually. It seems like, anyway, they find it easier to be strong. And some people, frankly, they struggle. And they struggle maybe the entirety of their life. Spiritually, emotionally. Life's just harder for them. And you know what? 
You might think, I've encouraged, I've encouraged, I've encouraged. I've sent a card, I've made a call, I've visited with them, I've taken them food, I've done all that I know to do. Remember this, he said, be patient. It's kind of like saying, you keep on doing it. And then help the weak, support, uphold. Can you, okay, just suppose somebody needed to reach a height, there was no ladder, no chair, and you says, here, get on my back. And they do, they climb up on your back, and you're upholding them. And you're thinking, you about finished? I'm getting tired down here. Enough already? Yeah, physically you'd get tired. And so sometimes with helping the weak, supporting, upholding the weak, the wings get tired. He says, you be patient with them all. You know, I, I realize that Sunday morning you hear a sermon, and Sunday night you hear a sermon, and you've heard a Bible class on Sunday morning, and you back Wednesday night you hear a Bible class, and you come tomorrow night, you eat, and then you hear a Bible class. And there's such a tendency, I think, to we hear it, and, 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 and hopefully we listen. But then we kind of go our way. Well, I hope that we don't just go our way and forget the responsibility I have towards the insiders. The responsibilities I have towards my brothers and my sisters in Christ. You know, and, and this isn't verse 14. Again, we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. This is not party time. This is not Sunday after worship fellowship time. This is. You know, ever use the phrase, where the rubber meets the road? This is where Christianity gets very real. This is where Christianity makes difference in lives. It doesn't say walk and talk in that verse, but it is kind of the walk and talk towards insiders. If you are not yet a Christian, I beg of you to realize God's grace will save you from your sin. God sent his son, Jesus died, shed his blood on the cross to be our savior. But we must respond as the Bible teaches in faith to turn from our sin, which is repentance, to be buried, immersed in Christ, which is water baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And if there's a need for prayer, we'd be glad to take the time and pray for you. If you need to come tonight, please come as we stand.